what comes to mind when you think about privacy? Most likely, it's social media and targeted ads. What does it cover? Is it a right to be left alone and to control one's information? Is it a tool used by society to protect one's dignity? To most of us, it is a means of protecting information that we do not want to share. Why am I telling you about privacy? Because it relates to everything that we do, from the cookies that we accept when entering a new website, to the password that we enter when creating a new account, privacy is present. If we, to become advocates for our privacy, we need to rethink about how we define our privacy. To do this, we need to travel back to when laws were first starting to emerge regarding this important matter. In the 1890s, privacy laws were first established, describing what is protected as private and the extent to which it should be protected. In these discussions, some declared privacy as a moral matter, while others declared it as a right that needs to be protected by society and the law. Of course, one can be oblivious to the privacy interests of another without violating any of their privacy rights. Some theorists argue that privacy should focus more on the control of information, while others argue that it is a much broader concept required for human dignity. Of course, this is complicated by the fact that privacy is something that we value to maintain a safe space. Others, however, are concerned by the negative attributes of privacy that permit people, under the cloak of privacy, to allow domination, degradation, and abuse towards women and others to flourish. To what extent is privacy harmful to the safety of others? To unpack this, let's travel back to the time of Aristotle. Aristotle was a famous philosopher known for encouraging critical and systematic inquiry into fundamental questions of right and wrong, truth and falsehood, and the nature of reality. One of the many things that he discussed within his lifetime was the topic of privacy. He simplified the complex polarity into two spheres, polis and oikos, city and household. These are the two spheres of life. As important as privacy is in this digital age, it was for ancient Greece. This private public distinction is also sometimes referred to as the appropriate realm of governmental authority, which is contrary to the realm of self-regulation. Of course, in the real or hypothetical condition of human beings, all of the world's collective information is public, and one has the right to bodily security and can obtain property by working for it. For instance, if you were to build a house or buy it with money that you worked for, and the police were to enter this house without a warrant, this would not be an infringement of your privacy rights, but rather an infringement of your property rights. As of the late 1960s, there was no real regulation to the topic of privacy. In an attempt to systemize this expanding right to privacy, legal scholar William Prosser stated four basic intrusions upon the right to privacy. One, intrusion upon a person's private affairs. Two, public disclosure of embarrassing private facts. Three, publicly placing one in a false light. And four, appropriation of one's likeness for benefits. These are the framework for many of the laws that exist today regarding the topic of privacy. One way to view the complex views of privacy is to view it as a system divided in two categories, reductionism and coherentism. The reductionists are generally critical of a right to privacy, while the coherentists view it as a fundamental right. What if I told you that there is no right to privacy and that there is nothing special about it? Well, this 
is a view of Judith Jarvis Thompson, a famous reductionist and creator of the trolley problem. She reviewed a large number of cases relating to violations of a right to privacy. Upon looking through all of these cases, she concluded that indeed they could have all been thoroughly explained using terms to the violation of property rights and the right to bodily security. Essentially, Thompson believes that the right to privacy is, in fact, a cluster of intertwined property rights, and that there is no such thing as a right to privacy. Circling back to the topic of privacy on the internet, what harm is there in acknowledging companies' access to your personal information? If allowing companies' access to your personal information allows you to receive a more tailored browsing experience on platforms such as Instagram and YouTube. In fact, when you accept cookies, you are giving a chance for companies to collect your information and place targeted ads on their web pages in exchange for money. 95%, you don't need to accept cookies. In fact, you can decline the cookies. But 95% of people accept cookies when given the opportunity to decline them. I'm one of those people, and many of you are too. But if we have the ability to protect our privacy, why don't we? And why don't we, why do we talk about protecting our privacy when there is something that we can do about it? Essentially, privacy is the tension between an individual and society's needs. It is the right of an individual to control what is known about them by the internet and public, and it allows individuals to have control of what the public knows about them. Why am I telling you about all of this? Well, if we truly want to become advocates for our privacy, then we must take the necessary measures to prevent sharing it with unwanted third parties. Now that you have all of this information, think about what privacy means to you. Maybe next time you have the ability to deny cookies, think about how you define privacy. Thank you.